بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد uh, We'll be resuming from where we left off two weeks ago We had a break last week because of the uh, weather conditions And if you remember uh, two weeks ago we had discussed We had begun to discuss the preparations for the hijrah And we were talking about the two types of uh, bay'as, the two types of covenants that took place with the people of Medina. Uh, the first covenant and the second covenant, al bayat al-Aqaba al-Ula and al bayat al-Aqaba al-Thaniya. And remember that the second covenant, it took place in the twelfth year of the prophethood. And the main difference between the first and the second covenant, who can remind me? What was the difference between the first and the second covenant? <laughs> so which one is the woman's covenant? The first one. Why was it called the woman's covenant? Bay'at al-Nisa. <laughs> there was no commitment. <laughs> there was no political commitment. There was no commitment to fight. There was no commitment to protect. Hence, this was called the women's covenant. And then the second covenant was called the covenant of war, basically. This is the covenant where the Prophet asks them to protect him like they will protect their own women and children. And notice, and it's a key point here. The covenant mentions defensive protection, not offensive attacks, right? And this is going to come up in the Battle of Badr. We're going to mention this again. That the Battle of Badr was not a defensive battle. And so when the Ansar participated in it, the Prophet ﷺ had to then basically ask them, are you agreeing? Is this fine with you? We're going to mention this later on. But the, the covenant, the second bay'ah, was about a defensive uh, covenant, and therefore... The Prophet ﷺ said, you will protect me like one of your own. They asked, what will we get in return? The Prophet ﷺ said, what do they want in return? Jannah. You will get Jannah in uh, return. Now, uh, we had, uh, I think we had mentioned uh, Asa'id ibn Zurara uh, standing up and reminding them that before you give this covenant, I think we stopped over here if I'm not mistaken. Asa'id ibn Zurara stood up and he said, Perhaps if we close the door, I'm gonna just close the door. Maybe let the outside noise there. And he said that, oh people, don't be hasty. Don't be hasty. We have traveled all this way from Medina, knowing that he is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We know this to be true, but realize that this covenant is not like the first one. He's basically saying, right? Realize that if you say yes to this, you will lose children. You will make women widows. You will have to fight the other people. And so if you're ready to do this, then take the oath of covenant. Otherwise, excuse yourself now. Perhaps Allah will excuse you because you didn't stand up to the commitment. Don't promise and then back out before you do this. So, As'ad ibn Zurara, clearly he shows that he's a leader. He shows he's thinking about the future. And of course, As'ad ibn Zurara has a lot more stories uh, later on after this. When As'ad said this, the people of the, uh, they're not yet called Ansar. We're calling them Ansar a little bit loosely here. They're not yet Ansar. They're going to be Ansar after the Muhajir will come to Medina. Uh, in fact, it's not even Medina yet. Remember, it is Yathrib. Right, it's all going to be built up. Uh, the uh, people of the Khazraj and the Aus, or the, the people who would be the Ansar, said, O oh, Asad, remove your hand. We want to take the oath of allegiance from the Prophet. And so, one by one, all of the 70 plus men took the oath of allegiance, and there were two women there, and they gave the verbal allegiance to the Prophet. Uh, as Aisha said, that the Prophet never touched a woman. Uh, that was not his mahram. It's definitely against the sunnah. Uh, whether it is haram or makruh is an ikhtilaf, but there is no question that it is not of our sharia that men and women should be uh, shaking hands or, fr or, or freely touching one another. Most scholars say it is haram, just a fiqh point. A minority says that it is makruh, but they all agree that it should be avoided. And the Prophet ﷺ never touched the hand of a woman, even in shaking hand, even in giving the oath of allegiance. So the two women gave their oath of allegiance verbally. They didn't shake the Prophet ﷺ's hand. And all the while, Abbas was standing there not pleased. He was not happy at what his nephew was doing. He felt very awkward, and he kept on saying to himself, I don't know any of these people. They're all youngsters. I haven't dealt with any of them. And Al-Abbas is thinking in the ways of the Jahiliyyah of old that you don't have the protection of the elders. 
Why would these people do anything for you? Because again, for them, it's all about loyalty. It's all about, you know, we, we all kind of understand the gang mentality. Whatever leader says goes in the gang. This is what tribalism is. If the leader says it, then the whole tribe has to follow suit. And Abbas is saying, I don't see the elders. These are not the people I know. These are all hudatha'ul asnan. They're youngsters. And I don't know whether they'll fulfill their treaty with you or not. And of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had already chosen them for this uh, issue. It is narrated in Ibn Hisham that while this oath was going on, they heard a loud voice in the middle of the night. Now remember, this is pre-dawn. And if anybody's, you know, been outside in pre-dawn, it's in the desert, it's deadly silent. And one voice can carry a long way. And as they're taking this pack, they heard a loud voice in the valley of Mina. Remember, they're in Mina. And they're just in Aqaba, which is close to the Jamarat. It's a valley behind the Jamarat. They heard a loud voice cry out, O people sleeping in the tents, meaning, meaning the Hujjaj. O people sleeping in the tents, do you not know that a group of rebels, a group of blameworthy people, have gathered together with the Sabi' to wage war against you? What is a Sabi' A sabit is mentioned in the Quran, as sabiuna wa nasara, right? The term sabit comes in the Quran, uh, 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 that Yahud and sabiuna and nasara. And the Arabs would call anybody who left their religion a sabit. They would call anybody who left their religion a sabit. And many times when the Sahaba converted, the news would spread, qad saba'a. So and so has saba'a. And saba'a for them meant to leave their religion and to become. Uh, a monotheist. Now, just as a footnote, who are the Sabi'un that the Quran mentions in the Quran? Uh, in, this, in this hadith, the term Sabi'un is not meant as the same as the Quranic one. I reiterate, the Arabs would call anybody who converted away from their paganism Sabi'. This is a generic term. Sabi' means for them monotheist. That he's become Saba'ah, he's become a monotheist. However, the Quranic term for Sabi'un is clearly a group of people, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that, uh, um, what is the verse of Baqarah? Uh, right? The believers and the Yahud and the Nasara and the Sabi'un. So Allah is talking about a specific group of people. And just FYI, which is a bit of a tangent, but everybody always asks about this, that who are the Sabi'un? The Sabi'un are a group who go back, it is said, to even before Christianity. So much so that they claim to have a book from Sheath. Who is Sheath? Who is obviously some prophet, mashallah, but who? <laughs> Sheath is the son of Nuh. Sheath is the son of Nuh. Right? And so they say that they have a book from that time. And they still exist in our times. Very small quantity, probably less than 30,000 still alive. 30,000 is one of the smallest religions in the world. And uh, I looked up some of their beliefs and aqaid uh, and, and culture, and it's very strange that they still have a concept of tahara. They still, they don't eat pork. Uh, they, uh, they have to do ghusl after janaba. Uh, they have certain rulings that clearly they show they have some type of sharia. And they believe, in these days, they believe in the stars. That the stars have some type of power and effect on them, the Sabi'un. And they come from the land that is the cradle of civilization that has all the religions and the subcultures and the sects of the world, which is? Where? Iraq. Iraq is the land where everything comes from. So they are actually, these days they're all Iraqis. And they are called, maybe some of you have heard of them, they don't, they're not called Sabi'un in our times, they're called? Hmm? La, Zoroastrians or Majus? La. No, Kurds are an ethnicity. <laughs> Kurds are an ethnicity. They are called? La. Al Manda'iyun. Have you heard of these? Any of you? Huh? Manda'ians, they're called. Manda'ians. Al Manda'iyun. Uh, and they still are around. This is the Sabi'un. These days they're in Iraq and then there's a huge. Uh, 
uh, amongst them in America, obviously, as well, because they came as refugees. So there are Mandaean groups here in America as well. Anyway, that's the point, getting back here. Uh, the term Saba used by the Quraysh means leaving, uh, leaving paganism to monotheism. The Quranic term for Salah means, uh, as we said, the Manda'iyun. Now getting back here. So they heard a loud voice scream out, O people of the tents, don't you know that there's traitors plotting to wage war against you under the Sabit with the capital S, the big Sabit. Meaning of course the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the voice comes out to awaken the people in the tents in the middle of the night. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, This is Azab ibn Uzayb, the shaytan of Aqaba. Azab ibn Uzayb, the shaytan of Aqaba. I swear by Allah, Ya Adu Wallah, I will deal with you. So, shaytan felt so overwhelmed at this time that he actually went public. Because shaytan is private, right? Shaytan is hidden. He rarely comes out and screams. But he felt so overwhelmed that things are going to change now, that he actually screamed out to the human world. And he screamed out to the people of the tents that, do something. Here are the, the, the traitors that have come to kill you. Do something. And so the Prophet uh, subhanAllah, he knew the name of the shaitan. He knew which one this was. And this also shows that, and we know this from other things as well, that the shayateen live in abandoned valleys. The shayateen live in the places that people don't frequent. And they have leaders and they have... So this is the leader of the valleys, shaitan, the shayateen of the valleys of Aqaba. And he said, this is the leader of the shayateen of Aqaba, Azab ibn Uzayb. And the names of the shayateen are always very weird and convoluted with lots of consonants and vowels. And the Prophet obviously knew the name of the uh, shaitan and the jinn. And he said, wallahi, I will deal with you. Uh, the, the Ansar, when they heard this, they said, Ya Rasulullah, should we not, should we not launch an attack now? If they're going to fight us, shouldn't we preempt the attack? And we're 70 strong, we all have our swords, they are unarmed. Remember, it's Hajj. Remember, it's Hajj, they are not armed. Uh, in Hajj, you're only allowed to carry one weapon. And that is the weapon that you use uh, to fight against a, uh, an animal if it attacks you, right? It's not the fighting sword. There's different types of swords. They don't have the, the fighting swords. They have, a, if you like, a defense sword, right? Uh, a sword to just to protect yourself. Or in case something happens, this is an emergency sword. So the Ansar said, we're 70 strong. And they are not prepared. We can, we can attack them in the middle of the night. And we can uh, have a huge, if you like, victory over them. The Prophet ﷺ said, Lam umar I haven't been commanded to do this. This is not my methodology. I have not been commanded to just go kill the people like this. Lam umar This is a key point. We'll come back to this. I have not been commanded to go uh, kill these people. When this news spread, the Ansar then basically the, the meeting wrapped up quickly. The bay'ah was finished and they went back to their tents silently just as they had come. And the next morning, the uh, delegation from the Quraysh was sent to every single camp. Because the news has spread, the rumors have spread. A delegation from the Quraysh is sent to every single camp that, do you know of any meeting that took place with this man Muhammad Do you know anybody who met? Did anybody from your tribe meet? Until finally when they went to the tents of the Khazraj, when they went to the tents of the Khazraj, remember every tr tribe has its area. When they went to the tents of the Khazraj, the Quraysh come in and they say, who amongst you has met with the Prophet Muhammad Has any amongst you met with this man? And so the, the Muslims remain silent. And the pagans spoke up and they said, no, by Allah, we have no idea what this is. We swear by Allah that none of us have gone to meet him. And the Muslims remained silent. They didn't say anything because they're not allowed to lie. And the Quraysh, or I mean, sorry, the, the pagans of the Khazraj, because again, Khazraj are not all Muslims now. They're the ones who basically spoke up and the Muslims went in behind that oath and the matter was uh, resolved. And this clearly shows, uh, this clearly shows that the Ansar are developing their Iman, their, their, their strength in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, their courage, their fear. Not only do they say, they're the ones who say, for how long are we going to take the Prophet and let him be persecuted? For how long will we allow him to be repelled from one tribe to another begging for protection? Why don't we adopt him? Why don't we take him on? And then they are the ones who volunteer. What if we launch an offensive? Even though this was wrong at the time, but it shows their Iman. And the contract had not been for an offensive jihad, it had been for a defensive jihad.
But automatically they're eager to protect the Prophet and therefore when the Battle of Badr took place, which was offensive and not defensive, they all volunteered. None of them held back and said, hey hold on, you only promised us defensive. None of them had that type of Iman, that they're shortchanging, even though the letter of the law was defensive. That's what the treaty says. That you will protect me against attack like you protect your own children. Just like you protect your own family, that's all I'm asking. Protection. And when the time came, the Ansar, none of them held back and they went forward like the greatest of the Muslims. And indeed, we talked about the blessings of the Ansar over and over again. And that is why the Prophet ﷺ said that uh, this hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim. And he said this after the conquest of Mecca. He said, لَوْلَ الْهِجْرَةِ Were it not for the Hijrah, لَكُنْتُ إِمْرَأً مِنَ الْأَنصَارِ I would have been a man from the Ansar. It's the Hijrah that's forcing me to be a Makki because I was born there. But other, otherwise, I would have been a person of the Ansar. And if the Ansar went in one direction, and all of mankind went in the other direction, I will follow the direction of the Ansar. This is a hadith praising the Ansar. And uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, and this hadith is in Bukhari, حُبُّ الْأَنصَارِ مِنَ الْإِيمَانِ Simple Arabic, everybody should understand. حُبُّ الْأَنصَارِ مِنَ الْإِيمَانِ That loving the Ansar is a part of uh, Iman. And in another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, Hating the Ansar is a sign of hypocrisy. Hating the Ansar is a sign of hypocrisy. And therefore, as Muslims, we are commanded to love not only all of the Sahaba, the Muhajirun have a type of love, the Ansar have a type of love. And in another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, Allahumma fill lil Ansar wa li abna il Ansar. Oh Allah, forgive the Ansar and the children of the Ansar. And on and on, so many of the blessings that are given for the uh, Ansar. Uh, and of course, one of the most beautiful ones after the conquest of Mecca, when the Prophet ﷺ uh, especially after the battle of Hunayn and Ta'if, when the Prophet ﷺ gave many of the leaders of the Quraysh uh, and the people of Hunayn and the people of uh, Thaqif, he gave them large amounts of money. He gave them large amounts of money, especially the people of Thaqif, they were not willing converts. The people of Thaqif were one of the last tribes to convert, and the people of Hunayn as well. So he gave them lots of money. To one of their leaders, he gave an entire valley full of sheep. This is like a few thousand sheep. And the Ansar felt a little bit like, look, we're the ones who participated. We're the ones who fought. We're the ones who got all of the booty. And now it's being given to them. So they felt something and news spread that, you know, there's a little bit of mumbling. And after all, they are human. All of us, you know, we are human in the end of the day. And they felt something that, how come we're the ones who fought and yet they get the bulk of the booty, of course they got their share, but then there's an extra amount that is given uh, voluntarily. And that's the, the rules of uh, distributing ghanima are a different topic, but it is up to the commander. The, every single warrior gets a share, and then it's up to the commander what to do with the surplus. If he wants to give it back to the army, he wants to give it to Bayt al-Mal, he wants to give it others. So the process in that particular battle didn't give it back to the warriors, the surplus. He gave it to these particular leaders who has, whose iman was very weak. As you know, one of the types of zakat is what? Mu'allafati qulubuhum, right? To gain their, to gain, and you know the tribal leader, what did he say? When he got these sheep, he went back to his people and said, Oh my people, embrace Islam. For wallahi, I have met a man who does not fear poverty. He does not love wealth. I, he must be a prophet. So he told his people to embrace Islam. And that little bribe, basically, made him genuinely convert. That no human being can give this many sheep, you know, and feel nothing in his heart. This is a man who's truly a prophet of God. So in fact, it worked. But again, getting back to the issue here, the Ansar felt something in their hearts. You know what the Prophet ﷺ said? He called a meeting just for the Ansar, none of the Muhajirun, just for the Ansar. And this also shows, by the way, and again, we love all of them, but the Muhajirun, no doubt Allah had preferred them over the Ansar. Right? The Muhajirun, Allah had preferred them over the Ansar. And Allah says in the Quran uh, that uh, Muhajirina wal Ansar, He always mentions, whenever Allah mentions the both, He mentions Muhajir first. And there's no doubt that the level of the Muhajir is higher. The murmuring was not amongst the Muhajirun. The murmuring was not amongst the Ansar. So He made sure there was no Muhajir in the tent. And then He said, uh, he reminded them, Oh Ansar, didn't I choose you above the people? Didn't I leave my people for you? Didn't? And then he mentioned this hadith here. Were it not for the hijrah, I would be a person of the Ansar. 
And if you went in one direction and all of mankind went in another direction, I would go in your direction. And then he said that beautiful phrase, O Ansar, O people of the Ansar, are you not happy that these people go back with sheep and dirham and dinar and you go back with the Prophet wasallam? And of course they began you know, crying at this because how true, I mean subhanallah, how true, you, they're going back with these, you know, I have chosen you, I could have stayed in Mecca now, but I gave you my word, I gave you my word at the time of Aqaba, right, even after the conquest of Mecca, the Prophet did not stay in Mecca, because of this Aqaba, he said, that's what the Ansar said, remember their, their fear was, once you win over everybody, will you then leave us, that was their fear, so he said no, Adam Adam. And this is an expression in Arabic which means my blood is your blood, my destruction is your destruction. We are now one. We are now one. And therefore, when this incident happened, he reminded them way back in this. And he said, look, I'm coming back with you and everybody else is going back with money and sheep and gold and dinar. Aren't you satisfied with this? And of course, that was the last of the murmuring and this shows us the wisdom and the leadership of the Prophet wasallam. Now before we move on, some wisdoms of building up the Ansar. And again, I stress, and I've said this point before, but wallahi, it is one of the most important lessons, in my opinion, from these stories. And that is the element of being genuine and sincere at every opportunity that is presented to you. This is, for me, one of the most important lessons here. That the Prophet was not expecting victory to come from this small Khazraj. He was not, it was not even on his radar. He was concentrating on the larger tribes. And this is common sense, nothing wrong with that. But he didn't trivialize the smaller tribes. Six people from Khazraj, he didn't even recognize. Man al qawm Khazraj. Which Khazraj? The Khazraj of the Yahud of Yathrib. He couldn't even, it didn't register. Which Khazraj? Right? They said yes. Six people, they didn't even have a tent that time. They're sitting in the middle. They're not like the big ones that he's going, the Kinda and the, the Banu Kilab. There's no, this is small tribe. But this is what we do. You don't know the opportunity. You don't know the person you're speaking to, who he's going to become or who he might be and you don't know. You don't trivialize any opportunity. So he didn't trivialize and look, he planted the seeds and these seeds became the entire Islamic Republic. Also look at how the process and built them up. Now this entire series is taking three to three and a half years. Firstly, he talks to them. They think about it. They say, we'll think about it. Some of them perhaps converted and they die. We don't know. But it is then said that they did, uh, the wars of Bu'ath were going on. So some of them, it is said they died as Muslims and Allah knows best. They come back the next year, the first batch of actual converts. So they are given the bay'ah of women. Then they come back the third year. Uh, and by the way, the second year, the Prophet then sends them Mus'ab. And he sends them somebody to teach them. Islam spreads to every household in Medina. In one year, Islam spreads to every single tribe. Some people convert. They come back the next year, more than 75 roughly come back. And for every one of them, there must be at least two Muslims in Medina. So we have already 200 Muslims in Medina. Right? In one year's da'wah. And they invite the Prophet ﷺ uh, back. Also notice the, the wonderful ways of Allah. And here's the point. When Allah is on your side, Allah will work things out for you. Look at how many things were set up. Firstly, the civil war between the Khazraj and the Aus, the wars of Bu'ath. Aisha says, these were a gift Allah gave to the Prophet ﷺ. But the gift was being given when the Prophet ﷺ didn't even realize he needed one. Right? When Abu Talib is alive, the wars of Bu'ath are going on. You see, Allah has His plans. Simultaneously, what's happening in Medina is unknown to the people of but it's not relevant to them. But Allah Azza wa Jal has a plan here. Things are happening in the world we might not understand, but there's a divine plan that everything will become clear to us. Also notice the irony of that group of Ahli Kitab in Medina who felt themselves superior to the pagans. And they kept on boasting over the pagans, the Ansar basically. We are better than you. We have a book. We have a prophet, we have a civilization, you have nothing. And our prophet has promised us that one prophet is going to come. And when he comes, he will be the conqueror and we will kill all of you. So for decades, for centuries, this is being instilled in them, right? Notice, this da'wah actually flips against the very people who are giving the da'wah, right? The very people who are saying this, 
they don't accept the message. And the people whom they're mocking, they are the first ones to accept it because it makes complete sense now. We knew that a prophet was coming. We knew that somebody would be coming to preach the message. We've been hearing this for generations and centuries. Obviously, this is the person, right? Again, it's the mysterious ways of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they are trying to consider themselves superior, but in fact, the people whom they think are inferior are really the ones who are superior. And again, these are the ways of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also notice as well how the iman slowly grows in the Ansar. We already pointed this out, that they became brave. They wanted to protect the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it's important to point out, they were the ones who offered to sponsor the Prophet And the Prophet didn't ask to come to Medina. They're the ones who said, come and we will protect you. And so his condition was, okay, if you're going to protect me, yes, I'm going to come. And this is a very important point to point out, that he did not impose himself on the people of Medina. The people of Medina wanted him to be their ruler, and initially, they were not the majority, but as the people converted, they became the majority. And as they became the majority, then the tensions arose, and that's going to be a, a, a constant theme of the uh, Medinan, of the Medinan uh, Sira. Notice as well, the important phrase, when the Ansar, or the Neo-Ansar, if you like, the people are going to become the Ansar, when they say, why don't we just kill all of them? Why don't we just launch an offensive they're all sleeping in their tents, right? Every one of us takes a few tents and will just, will cause huge damage. Because again, this is the middle of the night, it would have been a bloody massacre. Would have been a, a massacre of immense proportions. Because they're unarmed, and they're not expecting an attack, it's the last day of Hajj. What did the Prophet say? This is not our religion. I haven't been commanded, this is not what I've been commanded to do. Our, war, our religion is not about war and bloodshed and killing. That's not what Allah told me to do. Even if we have the upper hand that you're 70 and you have your swords with you and they're sleeping in their tents. No. Our religion is not about violence. Allah didn't tell us to go kill the people. No. Lam umar bithalik. Allah didn't tell me to do this. I have been commanded to do this. This is not my religion. Let us be persecuted. We're not going to be killing them like this in their sleeps. So clearly shows us that at such a time when for the first time in the history of Islam at this point, the Prophet finally has a mini army. Compared to what is going on, 70 people is a mini army. And they're all with their swords. And if he wanted to get retaliation, to get revenge, to make a statement, now was the time to do it and then run to Medina. He could have easily done that. But once again, this is not what our religion is about. Lam umar bi thalik. And then again and again we find the clear message of Islam, Islam is not about violence and bloodshed. Even in such a situation, when the Quraysh have done what they have done, this is not what I have been commanded to do. Clear example here that we can quote over and over again to those who say that Islam is a violent uh, religion. Also notice the beauty of the preparations of the Prophet Sallallahu that he is a very wise, obviously the wisest of all human beings. This meeting is taking place in the middle of the night, on the last night of Hajj, everybody is dead tired. Everybody is sound asleep. The next morning they're going to be going back to their places. The 13th of uh, Dhul Hijjah. Right? The next morning is the end of Hajj, that's it. And so the meeting is taking place when the people le least suspect it. And it is taking place literally under their noses in the next valley. He's also stationed people. Ali and Abbas, Abbas comes with him to represent. Ali and Abu Bakr, as we already mentioned, were stationed as lookouts to make sure that nobody is coming. And if they are, they're going to be warned. Notice he's the Prophet of Allah. So he knows Allah will protect him, but there must be a plan. Tie your camel, then put your tawakkul in Allah. There must be a plan. Even the Prophet is planning a logistical, sensible plan. In the middle of the night, away from the eyes, uh, we're going to meet at this time, this is what we're going to do. We have two lookouts here. If this is the Prophet Muhammad and he knows Allah will protect him without any doubt. How about us? We need to also have a vision. We need to have a methodology. We need to have a realistic, pragmatic plan taking into account the situation of our times. Also notice as well that clearly, and this is not being apologetic, it is a fact that there is a clear participation of women even in these matters. That the Prophet didn't say, keep your women in the tents, don't bring them. He, they came, they participated, and he took their oath, except that he didn't put his hand in their hand. Right? So women clearly have a role to play, and by the way, this 
treaty or this covenant was not the covenant of women. Even though these are women, this is the covenant of war. Right? Even though these are women, the actual promise that they gave was the same as the other men. And this clearly shows us that no doubt, I mean, women and men are different and there are differences that Allah Azza wa clearly mentions, but still, women have a role to play and sometimes that role is going to be a public role. And the Prophet didn't say, oh, you're women, I, I don't see any need for you to participate. No. He took the oath from these two women and indeed they lived up to that role. Uh, of the stories that we have, the, 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 the names of these two were Nusayba bint Kaab and Asma bint Amr. Uh, as for Asma, we don't have any details. You understand that um, it's a sad reality that most of the Sahaba we don't have lots of details about, right? This is just a sad reality that most of the Sahaba, if we even know two or three things about them, it's a big deal. You realize that uh, yani the names that we hear all the time, mashallah, these are big names, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, we can write books about them. How about the rest of them? And there were tens of thousands, tens of thousands of Sahaba. How about the rest of them? The bulk of them, we don't even know their names, not even their names. Those who participated in the final farewell pilgrimage, who knows who they are? You know, from all over Mecca, from all over Arabia they came, from every tribe, we don't even know their names. And for those whose names we know, sometimes we don't know anything other than the name because the hadith has their name in it, right? Because again, imagine if we were to document all the people of Memphis of one generation. How is this possible? Who's going to remember? So, no doubt the same thing happens here. So, for Asma, uh, binti, um, uh, for Asma binti Amr, we don't have any stories. I tried to look up at, I could not find anything from Asma binti Amr. All that we know is that she was the cousin of Mu'adh bin Jabal. Because Mu'adh is a Ansari. Mu'adh bin Jabal, the famous, uh, the Prophet said, the one who knows halal and haram the most is Mu'adh. This is her cousin. This is his cousin. As for Nusayba, we have quite a number of stories. Uh, and this clearly shows that when this uh, Ansariya, this, this, this Sahabiya, took this oath, she understood what it was and she lived up to it. Nusayba uh, bin Tika'b participated in the Battle of Uhud. And she was severely wounded with over 12 wounds in the Battle of Uhud. She had 12 wounds by the end of the Battle of Uhud. She also witnessed the Bay'at al-Ridwan. And she gave the oath again to the Prophet ﷺ at Bay'at al-Ridwan. Do you all remember Bay'at al-Ridwan? With Uthman ibn Affan, the rumor spread he's died. This is Bay'at al-Ridwan, right? And she was there as well. So she witnessed that oath as well. And so she becomes one elite and another elite because these are two separate blessings. These are badges of honor. These are real badges of honor, not the fake ones that people put on. This is the real badge of honor. She gave the oath of Aqaba and then she gave the oath of uh, Ridwan. Her son became one of the generals under Khalid ibn al-Walid and uh, he was martyred in front of her eyes. She was fighting alongside Khalid ibn al-Walid against Musaylama al-Kadhab. Musaylama al-Kadhab in the wars of Ridda. And her son was martyred in front of her eyes by Musaylama. He cut him to bits in front of her eyes. This is Musayba. And she participated in the war against the Romans. She's now in her 60s. And she goes and she fights against the Romans in the battle of Yarmouk. And her hand was cut off in that battle. As an old lady, she's still fighting behind Khalid bin Walid in the battle of Yarmouk. And her hand was cut off. And then we don't know what time she died or anything after this. The history basically dries out. I tried to look up as much as I could about her. These are the tidbits that we found. But what is interesting... She gave the oath of allegiance to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and she lived up to it. She lived up to it at every opportunity in Mecca, in, sorry, in Medina, after the Prophet Sallallahu death and even in the land of the Romans because Yarmouk took place basically in the land of the Romans. She went all the way up there as well. And SubhanAllah, this shows again, uh, this is a lady doing as much as she has done. Clearly as well, uh, doesn't need to be said, the tactics of shaitan, the desperation of, desperation of shaitan. Here is shaitan, generally he is hidden and yet now he becomes so overcome with anger, so overcome with jealousy and hatred, he's calling out to the people to do something because he cannot do anything. And this shows us again the desperation of shaitan as Allah says in the Quran, uh, that, uh, O oh, you who believe, shaitan is a clear enemy to you. So take him as your enemy. In the shaitan alakum aduwun fattakhiduhu aduwa. And this is clearly manifested over here. And one final point before we move on. We are already sensing a change beginning. For the first time, and in fact, this is ironic what uh, Abbas said because that's exactly what the point is. These are new faces. I haven't seen them before. 
right? That's actually very true. These are new faces. There's a new phase beginning, right? A new sense, a sense of, for the first time, these people are saying, let us defend against you. Let us fight against you. And from a time of uh, humiliation and weakness overnight, the Muslim shall be transformed into a state of power and izzah, which is going to continue to grow and grow and grow. And this is the change from Mecca to uh, Medina. And thus, the second bay'ah was completed, and the Ansar returned home even more excited, waiting for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to come to their uh, city to come to their uh, new town, the city of Yathrib, that would eventually be called the Medina to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Also, again, before we move on, another very important point to be mentioned here. And this point is one that has very clear ramifications in our modern era. When we look at the seerah, this is an important point, I need you to understand this. When we look at the seerah, we find the Prophet ﷺ utilizing different tactics, different methodologies, and different visions for different circumstances. We have the early da'wah of Mecca. We called it the private da'wah. We had the public non-confrontational da'wah in Mecca. We had the political asylum emigration to Abyssinia, Habasha. We have as well the political state emigration to Medina, which is going to happen now. Right? Uh, in the Medinan phase, we also have times of peace and times of war with the people of Mecca. Right? Sometimes all out hostility. Sometimes peace treaties, such as Hudaybiyah. Right? We also have all out war with all of the tribes, such as Ahzab. When they come and attack, this is all the tribes. Now, the question here that arises does this mean that we should take the final phase that the Prophet basically died upon? Or are all of these phases equally legitimate based upon the circumstances and the situation? Do you understand the question here? Right? We see multiple phases in the life of the Prophet ﷺ. Multiple phases. The question is, are all of these phases equally valid? Such that we choose which one is the one that's conducive to our situation. Or are all of these phases merely like the prohibition of alcohol? It didn't come down once. Came down gradually, right? Initially, Allah says, Khamar has a lot of evil, some good. Then Allah says, don't pray when you're drunk. Then Allah says, that, avoid alcohol. So this piecemeal. We don't go back to the original understandings of the original verses, which basically meant you could drink at night. After Isha, you could drink. That's what the verse means, basically. Don't drink in the daytime. Drink at night, basically, as the understanding. So are these phases consecutively abrogated one after the other? Such that we have to go to the final, or are they all equally valid? This is a classic controversy. It's not a modern one. It goes back to the earliest scholars. And a small minority of them, and the most uh, hardcore in this was the Andalusian scholar Ibn Hazm. Ibn Hazm was the most hardcore. He said all of the earlier phases cannot be resorted to. We must go with the last phase. And that is all-out offensive war. And he was writing at a time of political, the beginnings of the decline of Andalus. Right, so there's a desperation here. We need to do something. Ibn Hazm witnessed the glory era, but he is seeing the decline. So there's a, a level of desperation that unless you do your something, we're going we're gonna to lose all of this. And that's exactly what happened in Andalus as well. However, this is a minority opinion. The majority of scholars have always understood that these phases are not abrogated. There's no reason to consider them to be abrogated, right? All of these verses still apply in every situation and phase. And therefore, alhamdulillah, we thank Allah, our religion has given us many options politically. This is a key point, and this, uh, let me be very frank here. It's a difference that I have with many of the uh, Islamic groups in the world. That they only have one vision for the whole ummah. You understand what I'm saying here, right? I can be even more frank. Well, I don't mind. The Ikhwan, the Jamaat Islami, the Hizb al Tahrir, all of these groups. As, this is as frank as I can get. Okay? They have one unified vision for the entire Ummah, whatever that might be. And in my humble opinion, this is, to be very gentle, this is not very wise or precise or academic. It seems to be, not very gently, naively foolish. <laughs> this is my position. That you're going to have one unified goal for the whole ummah, it doesn't work that way. 
Every group of people needs to look at their own situation. Every group of people needs to see what is happening in Pakistan is not what is happening in Egypt. What is happening in Egypt is not what is happening in Tunisia and Algeria. What is happening in Algeria and, and other Muslim lands is not what is happening in America. SubhanAllah, even in Western countries, what is happening in France is not what is happening in America. You know, and if you study the political climates of every country, you find so many scenarios, so many. So, in my humble opinion, this is why I disagree with uh, the basic premises of some of these groups. And with respect to all of them, there's good in all of these. And there's mistakes. We're all humans. We all have our good and our bad. My point is very simple. The scholars of every locality need to study the seerah fresh and new. Need to study it in light of their circumstances. Because the seerah will always be a source of inspiration, a source of model, a source of looking at how to live our lives. After all, he is role model for all of us, correct? And so every single group of Muslims should always go back to the Quran and Sunnah, should always go back to the seerah of the Prophet and find for themselves that which is the most suitable for their time and their place. And in my humble opinion, it is very clear that, and I've said this many times, that one of the models that is closest to our model is that of the Muslims of Abyssinia. One of the models that is closest, and of course you're never going to get 100% you know, hand-fitting a glove, that's not going to happen. But you have an overall model that you take as a basic example. The Muslims of Abyssinia had no political ambitions to conquer Abyssinia. None whatsoever. Their goal was to live peacefully and it is narrated that some people also converted. This is free land at the time. The uh, Niga says we know converted. It is also narrated, even though there's, there's nothing authentic, but there are, if you like, legends in early books. Nothing with an isnad, but there are uh, rumors, if you like, in the early books that some groups of uh, Abyssinians converted to, uh, to Islam. But that's besides the point. The main point that we all agree upon, they had no political ambitions to challenge the authority of the status quo. They had their business to worship Allah, to be free in their daily rituals, and the political system is what it is. And this is a basic premise that we as American Muslims can use. I'm not speaking about Muslims in Pakistan, Muslims in Egypt, that's not my business. I can comment as a human being, but I'm not an expert in their affairs. Let the scholars of those lands deal with it. For us as Western Muslims, and in particular as American, because even Western Muslims have differences, right? France is getting much more xenophobic right now. You know, Sarkozy just said yesterday, or is it today, that we have too many immigrants in France. And you know what he means. You know what he means by this, you know. There's one large group of immigrants, and that's uh, Arab Muslims in France. We have too many immigrants, we have to do something. By the way, that type of talk is really bordering on the final solution. More and more, this type of, of racism is basically reminiscing us, reminding us of the 30s of, of, of Germany, this type of talk, and Allah knows what's going to hold. But my point being, the scholars of every land need to look at their own uh, situation. And uh, in my humble opinion, it's very clear that the seerah gives us many alternatives, not just one vision. No doubt there is a perfect vision, and that's the conclusion. There's no question, khitamuhu misk. There's no question that that is the perfection. But does this mean that all of the others are invalid? No. We have options to choose from, and that's, I think, one of the beauties of the uh, seerah. Now, after the Battle of Aqaba, sorry, not the Battle, the Treaty of Aqaba, the Prophet ﷺ made a public announcement to the Muslims. In fact, some scholars even say he made this announcement before. We don't have a date when he made the announcement. He made an announcement in Mecca to the Muslims, most likely in the house of Darul Arqam. And he said, Allah has shown me the land that you shall emigrate to. I saw it in a dream. Allah has shown me the land that you shall emigrate to. And it is a land of date palms between two volcanic plains. Bayna Labbatain. And Labba is a volcanic plain. And actually Medina, it's very interesting that Medina is surrounded by, if you ever have the opportunity to take a flight to Medina, take one in the daytime. And then look outside the window when you're close by to Medina. And you will see clearly large places uh, outside of Medina with volcanic rock. Around this big volcanic rock. And this rock is very, you cannot walk on it. You cannot traverse it with, with, with horses. Uh, there must have been a volcano thousands of years ago, and therefore that molten lava, you see it porous. I've seen this many times. The rock is a very 
different type of rock. It's porous, with holes in it, very rough, very ragged, very difficult. And Medina is in between two volcanic plains and it has date palms. Two volcanic plains and date palms. So, according to one version, the Prophet ﷺ announced it, but he didn't know the city. He said, I have been shown it, and I think it is such and such. But he didn't know the city. Then a few days later, he said, Allah has told me it is Yathrib. In one version, he said, I thought it might be Khaybar. But it is in fact Yathrib. In another version, he said, I thought it might be, he mentioned a, a, a land in, in Yemen. Because there's only a few places in the Arabian Peninsula that has date palms uh, in a large amount. Khaybar is one of them. Khaybar is well known for its dates as well. And this place in Yemen is also. But both of those places don't have volcanic uh, mounds around them. It's only Medina that has both of these signs. The sign is date palms and volcanic plains. So the Prophet said, I saw it. And then in a later hadith he said, Allah has told me that it is Yathrib. So he gave them permission to emigrate. So the Muslims began emigrating by ones and twos secretly. None of them did so uh, in public except for one or two exceptions as we'll come to. Uh, and the reason of course for this is because the reason for this is, of course, that the Quraysh would not be willing to allow them to emigrate. The things were at their worst. Remember the tension right now in Mecca against the Muslims. And so the people began emigrating in small uh, secret groups. And it is said that the first person who emigrated uh, to Medina uh, was Abu Salama uh, ibn Abd al-Asad. Abu Salama, the husband of Umm Salama. Umm Salama is going to become one of the wives of the Prophet ﷺ later on. Of course, at this time, she is married to Abu Salama. Abu Salama was not from the Quraysh. Umm Salama was from the Quraysh. Abu Salama had been one of the few, uh, this was known at the time, it wasn't common, but it was there, that sometimes a man would leave his tribe and go live with the tribe of his wife. Right? And that also is referenced in the hadith, وَمَنْ كَانَتْ هِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى the famous hadith, right? That if a man makes hijrah for the sake of a woman, then his hijrah is for the sake of the woman. It's not for Allah. That's the reference here. That people did have this notion that sometimes the man would adopt the tribe of the wife. So Abu Salama was one of such Arabs. That he was an Arab, he was a free man, a noble man, but he was not a Qurayshi. And he had married Umm Salama from the Quraysh. So he had moved to Mecca. When the persecution increased, he was not a blood Qurashi, so he was persecuted more. So he left with his wife, Umm Salama, to Abyssinia. Then when the rumor spread that the conversion took place, remember the satanic verses story said, they returned back and they decided to stay. Rather than go back, they decided to stay. Right? So Abu Salama, Umm Salama are, are of the few who are called those who made both hijras. They made both, because you see, the bulk of those who emigrated to Abyssinia, from Abyssinia they went directly to Dar al-Islam Medina. Right? That's, that's majority. Very few of them, and Umm Salama is one of them, and Abu Salama is one of them. They did two hijras for the sake of Allah, and they are called the people of the two hijras. Because they emigrated both to Abyssinia, then they came back to Mecca, and then they emigrated again to Medina. Right, so that's two hijras. This is Abu Salama. So the first person to emigrate, it is said, was Abu Salama. And Abu Salama gathered his belongings, took his stuff, he put his wife, and he had one child at the time, put them on his camel, and uh, he made his way out. And he was the first, so he didn't do this secretly. He thought, this is my business, I can take whatever I want, right? That that's why, uh, this was one of the reasons why people started migrating secretly, because of this story. So Abu Salama didn't do this secretly. He just, you know, packed his bags, everybody knew he's about to leave. The news spreads amongst the people. So when he leaves, the Quraysh come and confront him with their, with their weapons. And they said, oh Abu Salama, where do you think you're going? He says, I'm going to Yathrib. What business is it of yours? I have a free man, I'm allowed to go. So they said, as for you, we have no right. Okay, you're not, we, we renounce your Qurashi lini. Khalas, you're not a Qurashi. Take our passport back, khalas, basically, you know. Retract your passport. As for your wife, she is ours. She's a Qurashi. And we will not let you take her or her son because he is our son now. This is pure dhulm. Not that they have any interest in Umm Salam. It's just pure dhulm. You know, and so they forced him to leave his wife and child, and they expelled him without anything. So he thought he's going to go with the family, and everything is taken from him, including his wife and his 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 son, and 
he has forced to basically flee to Medina on his own. When Abu Salama's tribe found out that he had been treated this way, their jahiliya got the better of them as well. And they marched to the Quraysh and they said, As for the lady, she's yours. But this boy is ours. And they took the boy. And the Quraysh held on as well to the boy. This was, we know very little details, obviously it's being described in some graphic terms here. But they picked up the boy to take him. And the Quraysh held on and it became a tug of war with a two-year-old. Until his hand was dislocated. And Umm Salama cried out that let them take the boy. Because it's her son being going to be killed now, basically. I mean, you know, tug of war. This is all jahili. Not that they care, but it's again a matter of prestige. And, you know, we call it in the nose, you know. The, uh, the issue of being arrogant. This is my, how, how dare you do this to, to, our, to our son, you know. This is our son. So, Abu Salama's tribe took the baby. Umm Salama is left with the Quraysh. And Abu Salama goes to Medina. And Umm Salama is narrating the story herself. She said, for more than 16 months, every day, year and a half, I would go to al Batha, which is uh, the farthest place outside of Mecca that is still within view of the city, right? Crying in the desert because that's where her child and her, son have, and her, her husband have gone, right? Crying every day. Not able to do anything because subhanAllah, you can imagine, she's a young mother, you know, she's lost her baby boy, she's lost her husband, and she cannot live and function normally. Every day I would be going, crying to the desert, until finally some of my uh, cousins had sympathy on me, and they came and they begged the elders, here's on the Banu Makhzum, uh, they begged the elders to, what do you have to do? She's just a lady, she wants to go with her husband and child, let her go. So after a year and a half, they let her go, she went to the, uh, the, the tribe of her husband, and by this time as well, tempers had calmed down, so they gave back the, her the boy, and so she took the boy, and she just walked into the desert, putting her trust in Allah that, I need to get to Medina somehow, right? How is she going to go to Medina? She has no, she doesn't know anything, I mean, she, but she, what else is she going to do? But Allah Azza wa Jal saves such people, I mean, when you have such tawakkun in Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, saves such people. And so she says that, by the time I got to Tan'im, you know Masjid Aisha, Tan'im, that's the outside of Mecca where we go, by the time I got to uh, Tan'im, there I met uh, Talha, uh, Talha, uh, Uthman ibn Talha, excuse me, Uthman ibn Talha. And Uthman ibn Talha is from the Quraysh, he's one of the young men of the Quraysh, and he's not a Muslim at this time. I met Uthman ibn Talha coming back from one of his expeditions, maybe he went hunting, something. And he's coming back, he sees me all alone at Tan'im, which is way beyond what you can see from the city. This is dangerous for a woman to be alone. You understand this, she's a young lady, she has her young son here, you know, uh, wolves, uh, la uh, 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 prey, uh, animals of prey, uh, of obviously evil people, she's all alone. So, so Uthman says, what are you doing? So she says, I'm going to my husband, Abu Salama. So he says, you're all alone. He says, I have no one, I, I have Allah Azza wa Jal. So Uthman says, Wallahi, this will not be. I will take you. And so Uthman, Umm Salama says, that I don't think there is any more noble gentleman amongst all of the Arabs than Uthman. I don't think there's any more noble gentleman than Uthman. He walked the entire way and he led the camel with his hand. He's walking from Mecca to Medina and he didn't say a word to me but when it was time to stop he would tell the camel to come down and he would go forward and her, turn his back on me. Because she's a woman, she has to come out, it might something might show, her leg might show something, turn his back on me. When I would get down, he would put me under the tree, let me sleep and he would sleep by the camel. And then in the morning I would get back on the camel and we proceeded this way. All the way from Mecca to Medina until finally when I could see the uh, the, the houses of Yathir basically, uh, he said, your husband is over there, and he then let me go uh, on the camel. This is Uthman ibn Talha, right? Not even a Muslim, but his honor, and he's a young man as well at this time, his honor and his, his, his gentleman, if you like, qualities, right? They're shining, how can I let this lady and her young child go? And will I imagine, I mean, would we have done even a fraction? Yani from Makkah to Medina, walking, walking, 
This is at least a two week journey. One way. On the way back, he doesn't even have a camel. Doesn't even have a camel, right? Uthman ibn Talha. Who is Uthman ibn Talha? No doubt Allah Azza wa Jalla will reward him, right? No doubt. I mean, you cannot, even he's a pagan, by the way. Even he's a pagan. But still, there's some type of karam, some type of akhlaq. Do you know who Uthman ibn Talha is? Well, firstly, he converted the very last batch before the conquest of Mecca. Allah gave him that honor. Along with Khalid ibn Walid and Amr ibn As. There were three people who converted the very last batch of converts before the conquest. Right? And that gave them an honor. Because Allah says in the Quran, not equal are those who converted before the conquest versus those who converted after. Right? لا يستوي منكم من أنفق من قبل الفتح وقاتل أولئك أعظم درجة They have a higher level. So the last batch was Uthman ibn Talha. And then, in the conquest of Mecca, when Mecca is conquered, the Prophet is handing out the prizes, if you like, the big prizes of the Kaaba. What are the prizes? Who will get to have what is called the Siqaya? Siqaya means the right to give the, 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 the water. Who will get the right to uh, the keys of the Kaaba? Who will get everything? So Abbas was given the Siqaya. Abbas was given the right to feed the, the, the pilgrims. It's a very big privilege, right? He says, O Messenger of Allah, give me the keys as well. I want both. Give me the keys as well. Right? And at this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed that in Allah ya'murukum an tu'addul amanati ila ahliha. Allah commands you to give the amana to those who deserve it. So the Prophet gave the key to Ali ibn Abi Talib and he said, Go give this to Uthman ibn Talha. And it shall be with him and amongst his descendants until the day of judgment. And anybody who tries to take it from him will be a zalim. So Ali went and gave it to Uthman ibn Talha. Uthman said, I thought that you guys were getting it, the Bani Hashim. Because the news has spread that they want it, right? And so uh, Ali said, Allah revealed in the Quran this about you. Inna Allah ya'murukum an tu'addul amanati ila ahliha. Allah revealed in the Quran, basically, that we need to give the keys over to you. The Prophet ﷺ gave it to Uthman ibn Talha. Can you believe for the last 14 and a half centuries, it has been amongst his descendants? To this day, to this day, the keeper of the keys of the Kaaba is from the descendants of Uthman ibn Talha. Because this is something, again, Allah will reward. You know, you, you do something for, and even though subhanAllah, he wasn't even a Muslim at the time. But still, there was a sense of honor. And, and who did he do this to? Someone who was going to become our mother. This is Umm Salama. Right? This is not just any Sahabi. Someone is about to become our mother. He didn't know it. Nobody knew this at the time. She's married to Abu Salama. Abu Salama dies, and then the Prophet marries Umm Salama. Right? She becomes our mother. Showing respect to her. Still as a pagan. Yet Allah Azza wa Jal will give that blessing to him. The keys of the Kaaba to this day are in the hands of the descendants of Uthman ibn uh, Talha. Also, there's many other stories as well uh, about this early immigration and the problems that people suffered. Uh, of the famous uh, stories is the story of uh, Suhaib al-Rumi. Suhaib al-Rumi, uh, the only Sahabi who spoke fluent Latin, by the way. Was the only Sahabi who spoke fluent Latin. Suhaib, by the way, was not a Roman. A lot of people uh, uh, think he was a Roman. No, he was not. Suhaib was from a northern Arabian tribe, the Arab tribe. He was conquered in the days of Jahiliyyah uh, and sold into slavery to the Romans. So he grew up in the land of the Romans. Where? We have no idea. Was it Rome itself? Well, we don't know. But he grew up amongst the, uh, the, the, the Romans. And he spoke fluent Latin. And it is also said he had a ruddy complexion, i.e. a whitish type of complexion. So this gave him the laqab Suhaib the Roman. Because you speak Roman, you look like a Roman, we might as well call you a Roman. And it is even said that he spoke Arabic with an accent. Because he grew up in the land of the Romans as a child, right? So he's ethnically Arab, but 
uh, his, his culture, his civilization, what he grew up with was Roman. So he became a slave amongst the Romans, and because he was ethnically Arab, I guess one of his masters sold him back to an Arab tribe eventually. Eventually, he works his way as an Arab uh, slave. He works his way to the house of Abdullah ibn Jud'an, who, uh, who has been mentioned in many hadith, and he was Aisha's distant relative, and he works his way to freedom. Clearly, he's an intelligent man. And even in the days of Jahili, of course in Islam, by the way, Islamic law guarantees if there are such a thing called slavery. Now there is none, but once there were slaves, Islamic law guarantees the slave the right to become free if he wants. It's called mukataba. If the slave wants to become free, then you make an agreement with him and you give him uh, uh, the time to work and he will purchase his freedom. Even in the days of Jahiliyyah, they had this. So Suhaib clearly, he's an intelligent guy, he's a smart guy, he works his way to become free. In the days of Jahiliyyah. And he becomes a free man, he becomes a minor businessman in Mecca. And again, this clearly shows uh, the impact, if you like, even with the Roman culture on him, that he's not going to take this slavery thing, he becomes a, uh, a, a free man. And he accepted Islam amongst the earliest batch. And his closest friend and the person who gave da'wah to him and they both converted the same day was Ammar ibn Yasir. Ammar ibn Yasir and Suhaib al-Rumi were always together. They were always their closest friends. And th so they accepted Islam together and uh, uh, they were well known throughout the Sira for being together. Suhaib decided to leave as well. Now remember, the Prophet is still in Medina. Sorry, Mecca. The Prophet is still in Mecca. These are the early batches of emigrants, right? So still it's not clear what's going to happen. Suhaib decides to leave as well. It looks like he tried to leave surreptitiously, uh, but eventually his news spread. And do realize, I mean, Mecca was a small town. Everybody's watching everybody. You know, news spreads very quickly, very, very, very fast. If you're going to leave, you have to pack your stuff. You have to have a certain mount, a certain animal. You have to have a lot of baggage for the food, water, etc. It's not that easy to be done. So, however, it was the news spread that Suhaib is leaving. So a delegation from the Quraysh, not a delegation, a militia from the Quraysh, marched outside of the city and surrounded him. Suhaib was armed. He was a single person by the day and he has nothing except himself and his belongings. Suhaib was armed. He pulled out his bow and his arrow and he said, O people of Quraysh, I have 40 bows in my quiver. And I swear by Allah that none of you will get to me until I've used all 40. And then when you get to me, here is my sword. And I swear by Allah, nobody will be able to get me until I get to him first. Now, the Quraysh didn't want Suhaib to leave, but they loved their life more than they loved Suhaib leaving. Right? Life is precious. And so, they were wondering what to do. There's this tension, standoff. They're outnumbered. I mean, Suhaib is outnumbered, but who's going to make the first move? And face the wrath of Suhaib. So, Suhaib said, what if I were to tell you where I hid all of my wealth. Because there's no bank accounts you transfer money to Yathrib, right? It's physical gold, physical money, and you have to hide it somewhere. Go out in the desert and hide it under a tree, whatever, and then later on you come and you discover it. What if I tell you where all of my wealth is? Will you let me go? They said, okay, deal. Deal. You tell, give us all your wealth and you walk away free. And so Suhaib told them where he had put all of his wealth and he has to tell the truth because if he lies, he's one man, they can catch up to him later on. right? Not just that he's a Muslim, he's not supposed to, but he has to tell the truth. So he tells them all of his wealth where it is buried. And so he literally arrived in Medina with just the clothes on his back. After having won his freedom, after having become a mini businessman, after having a good amount, a decent amount of wealth, he literally arrived in Medina to start completely from scratch. And as soon as the Prophet ﷺ saw him, he smiled and he said, Allah has revealed in the Quran about you, Ya Suhaib, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَشْرِي نَفْسَهُ ابْتِغَاءَ مَرْضَاتِ اللَّهِ There are those who sell everything that they have, they sell themselves for the sake of Allah, and he says, Ya Aba Yahya, that was his kunya, Ya Aba Yahya, قَدْ رَبِحَ التِّجَارَ قَدْ رَبِحَ التِّجَارَ Your transaction has been successful, your transaction has been successful, without Suhaib telling him what happened. Well, this is the miracle, without Suhaib telling him what happened, then nobody could have arrived before Suhaib. Of course, Jibreel has told him what Suhaib has done. And so the Prophet ﷺ tells him, your transaction has been successful. Your transaction has been successful. One more story and then inshallah we'll call it a, uh, an evening for tonight. And that is the story of Umar ibn al-Khattab and his emigration with uh, two people of the Quraysh. 
The story of Umar's migration we'll talk about in a while. But he mentions his companions. When Umar uh, decided to emigrate, he, he chose as his companions to, for the journey two other Sahaba. Ayyash ibn Abi Rabi'ah and Hisham ibn Amr ibn al-As, who is the brother of, um, of uh, uh, um, the... Uh, the um, he, sorry, Hisham ibn al-As, sorry, Hisham ibn al-As, who is the brother of Amr ibn al-As. Uh, so he chose as his companions these two. And the deal was, on such and such a day, we'll meet up at that valley outside of Mecca. And when dawn breaks, whoever is there will go. If you're not there, then we'll assume that you were stopped, right? Because it's, again, difficult to be migrating at this time. So the deal was, we're going to meet up at this particular uh, place outside of Mecca on this particular day. If you're there when dawn breaks, we're going to be going together. If you're not, then we'll just, we're going to have to leave and whoever is there will go. At the appointed time, Hisham did not show up, which means that he was basically stopped and prevented. Hisham did not show up and so Ayyash and Umar were the ones who migrated to Medina and they made it to Medina. By the time they got there, Abu Jahl and his brother were actually Ayyash's half-brother. So Ayyash and Abu Jahl and a third person all shared a mother, but different fathers. So Abu Jahl is the half-brother of Ayyash. And Abu Jahl had a brother as well, who's also the half-brother of Ayyash. You understand? Same mother, but different fathers, right? So Abu Jahl and his brother, this is still the process is in Mecca, remember? He's still in Mecca. Abu Jahl and his brother traveled all the way to Medina. And they went to their half-brother Ayyash. And they said to Ayash, Oh Ayash, don't you know what you've done? Do you know the state of our mother after you left? She cannot eat. She cannot drink. She has made a promise to Allah that she won't taste the shade. And she's in the sun since then. And she is in such a state that lice has, full, has made her hair completely full of lice. And she cannot enjoy any food. You know, she's on the verge of death, etc., etc. She's made a promise to Allah she's going to sit in the sun until she sees her son again. And they kept on going about stories and stories until Ayash's heart melted. His mother, you know. And so he decided to go back with them. And said, let me just take care of my mother, then I'll come. Umar said, oh Ayash, they're tricking you. They're tricking you. But this is his blood brothers here. I mean, you know, half brothers, right? They're tricking you. And then he said, if she's hungry, she can eat food. If she has lice, she can shave her hair off, right? You don't have to go back and do that for her. So Ayash said, no, I'll be a good son. Let me go back to my mother. And I also have some money. I left it. Now that I've, everything is secure here, I can bring the money back with me. Umar said to him, if it's money, wallahi, I'll give you all that you have. Don't go. No, Umar is not even his blood brother, by the way. But he's his Muslim brother. Right? If it's money, I'll give you all that you want. Don't go with them. I'm worried. They're going to trap you. And if it's your mother, then she'll deal with herself. You know? And they kept on insisting that, no, no, come back, your mother needs you, this and that. And so Ayash's heart became soft for his mother. So Umar pulled him aside and said, hey, look, if you're going to go, take my camel. Because my camel is stronger and faster than theirs. And if you find any treachery, ride back immediately to Medina. So he gave him his own camel. SubhanAllah, I mean, this is amazing here. That Umar is bending over backwards and his own blood brothers are going to, do you understand this is a trap, right? His own blood brothers are going to do this. But Umar feels more love for him than his blood brothers do. Giving him money, offering him all that you want, just take it, just don't go with these guys, please. Giving him his own camel, because it's faster than their camel. And then eventually as the road goes on, they start chit-chatting, you know how it goes in the safar, you open up and they're laughing and joking. Abu Jahl then says, oh, looks like my camel is... is um, uh, weary and tired, why don't we just uh, ride on yours because it is stronger. So let me ride on yours and then we'll let the camel take a break, right? And so Ayash doesn't realize that this is a trap. So he uh, makes the camel sit down because he's on his own camel now. He makes the camel sit down. As soon as he do this, they jump on him. And they tie him up and they make him a prisoner. And they carry him back to Medina as a prisoner and they march him around Makkah saying, this is how we treat our fools. This is the result, and this, the Prophet is in Makkah at the time, by the way, remember. This is still, he hasn't made the hijrah, right? So they bring Ayash back, and he discovers that Hisham, the one they were supposed to meet, is also being held prisoner. So he gets thrown into the dungeon with Hisham. They set up a prison in Makkah for these two, special just for these two. And they throw him in with Hisham. 
And the Prophet eventually migrates, uh, we're going to talk about his Hijrah obviously next lesson, migrates to uh, Medina, and when he first migrated, his first dua qunut was about Hisham and Amr, uh, Ayyash and all of these people. He would make dua for them after standing up from Ruku' and he would say, Oh Allah, save Ayyash. Oh Allah, save Salam ibn Hisham. Oh Allah, save the Mustad'afeen. Oh Allah, send your punishment upon the Quraysh. So he's so much concerned for these prisoners in Mecca, right? And he kept on asking the Muslims, Who will volunteer to save Ayyash? Who will volunteer to say, now saving Ayash means you're going to walk into the lion's den. And you're going to save them from, clutch them from the middle of the Quraysh, right? Nobody wanted to do that until finally, Al-Walid ibn Al-Walid, Khalid ibn Al-Walid's older brother. And his story, I think I mentioned it, but we'll mention it later on anyway. Al-Walid ibn Al-Walid, finally, when he kept on asking, he said, I will do it, Ya Rasulullah. I'll do it. And so he traveled to Mecca, entered it in the middle of the night, and Allah Azza wa Jal blessed him. His story is a long story, but he blessed him to basically find out where this, this dungeon was because it's not public knowledge. Uh, and in the middle of the night, he uh, broke into the dungeon and he uh, cut the bonds of Ayash and Hisham and uh, saved and, and, and uh, res um, rescued them and brought them back to uh, Medina. And again, that's all we know, but imagine, wallahi, these are the stories of legends, if you really think about it, you know? Walking into Mecca single-handedly. I mean, that's all we know. That's the, the details of the story. But can you imagine being in the shoes of Al-Walid ibn Al-Walid, right? Can you imagine trying to figure out where this place is, and then figuring out, you know, you're all, you know the guard, the arms, Allah knows what he had to do, we have no clue. But he then, uh, it is said he had to jump over the, 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 the wall, he didn't enter from the door, he literally climbed into the roof and then made his way down. This is literally a story of legends, like Hollywood movies couldn't get better than this, you know? This is the real stuff. This is the real stuff here that he's doing. And he saves the two prisoners of war, and he brings them back, and Khalid ibn Walid's brother, I mean, the same blood there, that, that bravery uh, is there. And uh, eventually they come back to Medina, and the both of them become famous Sahaba. As for Hisham, uh, is a very brave warrior, and he actually uh, dies fighting against the Romans in the Battle of Yarmouk. He had a big victory in the Battle of Yarmouk. It's uh, Hisham, the brother of Amr. And uh, again, these are Sahaba. Clearly, Allah has written for them destiny. Allah has written for them uh, Qadr. And inshallah, in our next week, we will talk about uh, the Prophet Sassam's Hijrah himself with Abu Bakr and the stories and what happened and the lessons we derive from there. We have around a few minutes for questions and then inshallah uh, break for salah. Bismillah. Yes. You mentioned earlier with the Saudi um, what are the powers of Zuhur of, uh, yeah, of, 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 of the book Zuhur um, referred to? Uh, the Zuhur is the book of David. Dawood alayhi salam. Therefore, the, the, the Psalms of David are in the Old Testament. Therefore, the Yehud are the followers of the Zabur. There's not a separate religion. There is no separate group who follows only David and not Moses. The people who follow Musa also follow Dawood. They view it as a continuation, which it is. So the Yehud are the ones who primarily follow the Psalms. The Christians look at these books and pick and choose what they want from them because for them the Old Testament abrogates the New Testament. But as you know, the Christian Bible comp is composed of the Old Testament. The Old Testament has in it the Psalms of David. The Old Testament has the Pentateuch, which are the five books of Moses, right? Uh, Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and, and uh, um, the, the others, I forgot them, the, the, the first five, the Pentateuch, and then you have the Psalms as well. The Psalms of David in the Old Testament, that's the remnants of the Zabur. And even in the Psalms of David, the most, the most uh, poetic of the Old Testament is the Psalms, the Psalms, the most hymns, the most singing that is done. And we as Muslims believe that Dawood alayhi salam, that was his book. That it was, Ya Jibalu awwi bi ma'ahu wa tayr wa alanna lahu al-hadid. That, O oh, mountains and birds, sing along with him. And we believe that the greatest voice ever given was the voice of Dawood. So his book that was, uh, that was given to him was a book of tilawa and a book of recitation. And if you read the Psalms of David, clearly, I mean obviously we believe there's been changes and whatnot, but the essence, some of the, the passages are still there. Very moving and there's so many hymns and so many praises of God and the, the God of Israel and describing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the most beautiful ways. So we believe that there are elements of truth in the Psalms of David and that's... Uh, what the Yehud and even the Nasara, the Christians also believe in the Psalms of David. 
Other questions? Yes. Salam alaikum. You uh, compared us to the immigration of Habasha. But Habasha's immigration was a temporary immigration. It was all supposed that they were going to come back and join the mainstream. So actually, in that sense, it seems we are closer to the Madani immigration and those of us who are here in America in that sense, not me, but the Americans who are born here, they have to like to be part of the political process. The only issue for the Sharia, they are trying to make sure that they raise this view that when your child or my child goes from that place, they say they want to bring Sharia. We are not planning to bring Sharia. But the issue is that we are more likely a permanent... If you say we're not planning to bring Sharia, this is closer to Abyssinian than they, Medinan. That's the key point. Abyssinia was a temporary, it was never supposed to be a... How do we know this when they immigrated there? How do we know this when we immigrated? Some people have surmised... The time has proven that. It, no, it's, this is... Hindsight is twenty twenty. Looking back, we can say Abyssinia was temporary. There is... Uh, an interpretation of the Sira, and again, this is all open term interpretation, that Abyssinia was a backup plan. Yeah, you, the critical mass there is going to get Yes, there was always this plan B in case Medina fails. And that is why, and this does make a lot of sense, because as soon as the Prophet migrated to Medina, he didn't tell the people of Abyssinia to come. In fact, it was only after, basically, uh, uh, the Battle of Khaybar, roughly, the seventh year of the Hijrah, Right? Ja'far joined basically at the time of Khaybar. And the reason that Khaybar is so significant is that for the first time it can be said there is no dire threat to the survival of Medina. Badr takes place, Uhud takes place, Ahzab take place, and they are over there. Right? And there's always an internal threat. Khaybar was what eliminated the final existential threat to Medina. So the question arises, we can now look back and say Abyssinia was temporary, but at the time, perhaps they didn't think it to be temporary. Point number two, even if it was temporary for them, they stayed there 10 years. What is to say we cannot extend that for 50 years, 100 years? And we live in a land in a temporary method for a while. Point number three, even in this temporary status, it is not as if they did not participate in the political process. We mentioned that they resorted to the courts, they went to the palace, they argued for their rights, right? Their rights to live as Muslims in this land, majority land. So that is being a part of the process. But they didn't intend to overthrow the status quo. Whereas in Medina, that was the intention. So one needs to be careful if one says that, then you are basically going a different tangent in my humble opinion and uh, that is one that the Islamophobes will jump on if you make that. And me personally, I think it is very clear. Uh, it is unrealistic to think of this as Medina. We are in a land of Abyssinia. In other words, we are a minority, we're 2-3% and our goal is to preserve our rights to worship Allah as the Muslims of Abyssinia had. Allahu alam. You had a question, just go ahead. Jews, uh, you know, well researched as they were, uh, were they anticipating that, you know, someone from their tribe would come? Oh yes, there's clearly no doubt that the Yehud were expecting one of their own to become a prophet. There's no question about this, right? Because, remember, uh, uh, Safiya's father, uh, Yasir ibn Huyay, uh, Safiya, the wife of the Prophet, her father and her uncle, uh, uh, um, uh, al Akhtal and Yasir, uh, the both of them, when they met the Prophet for the first time, Sophia narrates that I was a young girl, you know, you can imagine six years old, five years old, and I, my father and my uncle, I was their darling. Uh, they would always play with me. Uh, when I rushed back, when I saw them, they didn't even give me the time of day. And they were drained out of energy, they were, you know, lethargic, they didn't, they seemed to be greatly stressed out, and I heard them speak to one another. And they ignored me because she was a little girl. And uh, Sophia's father says, Ahua, sorry, her uncle says, Ahua, who? Is that the one? And her father says, A wallah, it is him. It is him. So his, her uncle says, What are you going to do? And the father says, We will oppose him till he dies, till we die. Right? <laughs> No, th that, th we don't know about that, if they saw the seal, Salman was the main one with the seal, but the characteristics that had been predicted had been mentioned. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself says, فَلَمَّا جَاءَهُمْ مَعَرَفُوا كَفَرُوا بِهِ When, 
what they recognize came to them. Allah says, يَعْرِفُونَهُ كَمَا يَعْرِفُونَ أَبْنَاءَهُمْ Right? They know him and recognize him as they recognize their own sons. So clearly, they, and this is what they were saying, that uh, we're going to be victors over you when the Prophet comes, we're going to massacre you. They expected this. There's even a theory that that's why they were in Yathrib. There's a theory, this cannot be proven, there's a, because the question to this day, by the way, nobody has a solid answer. What were these Yahud doing in the middle of the Arabian desert? I mean, there's no solid answer. Where did they come from? Were they original Yahud or were they Yahudi converts? And this, these are questions that nobody has any solid knowledge for because we don't have historical documents. All that we have is from the books of our seerah. That's all that we have. We don't have their remnants, we don't have their histories. So one theory is that this was a group who went out in search for the Prophet. And the signs that they had indicated, date palms, desert, uh, volcanic uh, mounds, and that's why they settled in both Yathrib and Khaybar. Right, that's one theory out there, and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best, okay? Sisters, any questions from the sisters? Yes, go ahead. Um, I was wondering about the peace with Allah. Is, is that not a solid The keys to the Kaaba are symbolic these days. And no doubt the political powers have the authority to demand the person to open the door or not, right? But the one who keeps the key and the one who will go and open the door has always been from the descendants of Uthman, <coughs> right? So the descendants of Uthman to this day, to this day, they, this is called the Sadana. The Sadana means to take care of the Kaaba. Every time the Kaaba is washed, they are called. Every time the Kaaba Ghilaf is changed, they are called because they are technically still in charge of the Sadana. Right? So the Sadana means the maintenance of the Kaaba. So Uthman ibn Talha got the maintenance of the Kaaba and his descendants had it and they still have it to this day. So no doubt it is a symbolic office. But it is nonetheless, I mean, who wouldn't want that symbolism, right? To go to sleep with the keys of the Kaaba in your house. I mean, maybe even they, I'm sure they don't even keep it in their house. They probably have, but I'm, my point is, technically they are in charge. And nobody opens the door other than that tribe. It's a tribe now, obviously. And obviously one of their members always gets chosen. When every time they die, then another one is chosen. So it is a symbolic honor. No doubt the political powers will tell them, this is the day we're going to watch the Kaaba. I mean, I, I don't think they would have that power to do that. But once that day is decided, who's going to go and who's going to be the one opening the door is going to be Uthman ibn Talha's descendants. Okay? <laughs> Inshallah. Um, the, uh, the Church of Nativity, right? It's still in their descendants? I, I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> it's still in the descendants of the original uh, one who was handed to? This happened, this was, this, this was, this has been kept from the, I'm sure the Palestinian was a better, better, but even the Church of Nativity, the keys were the Muslim, they were still. I wouldn't be surprised, alhamdulillah. Inshallah.